welcome to week 10's lectures on Arthur Conan Doyle's The Hound of Baskerville's. In today's lecture session, I'll be discussing the Gothic tropes, the Gothic landscape, as well as the anxieties of the past, present, and future. So Henry plans to follow in his uncle's progressive footsteps and continue modernizing Baskerville Hall by installing one of the recent benefits of modern science, electric lighting. I will have a row of electric lamps up here inside of six months, he enthusiastically tells Watson. And you won't know it again with a thousand candle power Swan and Edison right here in front of the hall door. The light of science will, he believes, dispel the long shadows that trail down the walls and hung like a black canopy about him. In the previous uh, lecture, I discussed how Baskerville Hall is being modernized by Sir Charles Baskerville. Now, Henry the heir of Sir Charles is continuing with the modernizing project. He is attempting to uh, renovate Baskerville Hall by bringing in the fruits of modern science, one of the fruits of modern science, which is this fantastic concept of electric lighting. And he tells Watson with a lot of pride that he will get the lamps installed within six months and the effect would be uh, wonderful because it will eliminate the gloomy shadows, the long shadows, the darkness that uh, envelops the walls of Baskerville Hall, it will eliminate, it will um, get rid of the black canopy, um, the suffocating atmosphere of darkness and gloom which um, suppresses the spirit of the hall. So science is used to dispel the gothic ambience, the gothic atmosphere of darkness and bleakness and gloominess. Like Sir Henry bringing electricity to Baskerville Hall, Holmes is also associated with light. And so with enlightenment, science and progress, as he seeks to shine the rational light of science on crime and criminals. It may be that you're not yourself luminous, he condescendingly tells Watson, but you are a conductor of light, implying that Holmes is the source of that luminosity. One of his favorite words is elucidate from the Latin ex, completely plus lucidus, bright, clear. In this uh, significant idea, Clausen draws a comparison between Holmes and science and light and enlightenment and progress. Holmes represents rationality, the rational light of science as uh, Clausen puts it, and this light of science is used to dispel crime. It is used to dispel um, the darkness that suppresses uh, Baskerville Hall. And Holmes becomes the embodiment of that kind of uh, weapon, the weapon of science. And Clausen points out that um, Holmes is associated with luminosity, light itself, the modern uh, invention of uh, light. And um, Holmes very uh, sarcastically points out that Watson is not um, bright himself, but he is useful in creating an opportunity for light to fall in. So he is the conductor uh, of light. And look at the language, um, the metaphor of uh, science being used to describe uh, the position and function of Watson in this uh, domain, which is uh, dominated by um, Holmes. As a scientist, Holmes contemptuously rejects the supernatural explanation of Sir Charles's death. 
I have hitherto confined my investigations to this world, and he dismisses the legend of the hound as of interest only to a collector of fairy tales. He scorns Mortimer's willingness to entertain a supernatural explanation for Sir Charles's death. Holmes is very, very uh, clear when he uh, rejects the possibility of the role of the supernatural in the death of Sir Charles Baskerville. He asserts that he is uh, someone who confines his investigations to this world, to this material temporal world, and uh, he rejects the theory of the hound, um, which is um, considered to have played a role in the death of Sir Charles um, Baskerville. And he says that such legends belong only to uh, the narrative collection of fairy tales. And he also dismisses um, Sir Mortimer's um, theory that perhaps there is a supernatural hand at the death of Sir Charles uh, Baskerville. So Holmes, the scientific man, uh, the luminous Holmes is uh, dismissing the supernatural theory, the gothic theory. And you, a trained man of science, believe it to be supernatural, adding, I see that you have quite gone over to the supernaturalist. When Mortimer mentions the footprints left by Sir Charles on the gravel path where he stood smoking, Holmes exclaims, if I had only been there, it is evidently a case of extraordinary interest and one which presented immense opportunities to the scientific expert. Once again, uh, we see Holmes um, accusing uh, Mortimer, who is a trained man of science, um, to, uh, you know, uh, to point out that how could a trained man of science be someone who believes in the supernatural? And he says, um, uh, it's amazing to see that you have joined the uh, group of the supernaturalists. So uh, Holmes is accusing a man of science here for uh, paying attention to such um, stuff which be belongs with the legends. And uh, Mortimer points out the scene of crime and uh, the, the uh, evidence of the footprints and Holmes uh, exclaims that uh, if only he had been there uh, because um, you know this uh, scene, this plot is, is something which offers extraordinary opportunities for the scientific expert and not for the supernaturalist. So once again um, Holmes claims this domain for the scientific expert and rejects the role of the uh, person who believes in the supernatural. That gravel page upon which I might have read so much had been long ere this much by the rain and defaced by the clogs of curious peasants. Holmes' most passionate appeal to science occurs when, in response to Mortimer's criticism that he is Entering into the region of guesswork, Holmes replies, say, Raja, rather, into the region where we balance probabilities and choose the most likely. It is the scientific use of the imagination, but we have always some material basis on which to start our speculations. The phrase, the scientific use of the imagination, as Lawrence Frank has shown, is the title of the essay by the Victorian physicist and geologist John Tyndall. By alluding to Tyndall's essay, Holmes implies that he's doing in the science of detection what Tyndall did in physics and geology. Let's look at the first um, point here raised by Clausen. The first one is that Holmes is um, saddened to know that he cannot uh, uh, possibly go over the uh, that site where the footprints had been uh, originally there because it had been removed by rain and the, uh, and the uh, footsteps of curious uh, peasants. Now that scene had been contaminated and therefore, uh, Holmes builds on um, his theory in, and, and uh, it's very interesting to see that um, 
that theory is being attacked by Mortimer, who thinks that uh, Holmes is entering the realm of guesswork because that scene is being uh, contaminated. Uh, and therefore, um, Holmes responds by saying that, yes, uh, I may be speculating, but there is always some kind of material basis on which to uh, start uh, his speculations. In fact, um, the idea that uh, there is a kind of a scientific use of the imagination is brought in. Um, so there is uh, the implication that science also relies on imagination at times to come in with um, better theories uh, and far more plausible theories. And Holmes' uh, information about developments in science and technology and physics and geology uh, informs the readers and those around him that his deduction is also a science which belongs with the different kinds of sciences that are being uh, put together, categorized. and. Um, that is very interesting, the way in which Holmes sees his work as a scientific work. Of course, sometimes science relies on imagination, but it is science nevertheless. But despite his claims to exemplify what he calls the scientific use of the imagination, Holmes' solution to the mystery of Sir Charles' death in fact shows little evidence of the use of science. Echoing a famous remark by Paul Dupont, Holmes tells Watson, the more outro and grotesque an incident is, the more carefully it deserves to be examined, and the very point which appears to complicate a case is when duly considered and scientifically handled the one which is most likely to elucidate it. But Holmes has not scientifically examined and handled the mystery at all. His explanation gives only the illusion of a strictly scientific method. Neil Clausen's point is here fantastic because he argues that the scientific basis of Holmes's theory and resolution is resolution is a bit shaky um, in terms of this particular novel, The Hound of the Pascal Wills. In fact, um, he points out that there is hardly any serious scientific examination uh, of the um, evidence and the and and the clues left behind um, uh, on the crime scene. And the point is that um, Holmes seems to depend more on the imagination part of this phrase, the scientific use of the imagination, in order to arrive at his solution to the uh, death of Sir Charles, uh, Sir Charles Pascoe Will. So um, this point, um, the more uh, extraordinary and out of the ordinary and grotesque an incident is, the more it deserves to be studied. The point uh, by uh, Dickens is something that we have um, considered before, but it is interesting to um, revisit that idea to understand that uh, even though Holmes emphasizes a thorough examination of the scientific kind, um, it is uh, inevitable that in this particular instance, Holmes is relying more on the imagination to arrive at his solution. Holmes' solution to the murder is almost as effortless and as unscientific, and he boasts to Watson, I had guessed at the criminal before ever we, um, before even we went uh, to the West Country. The very thing that Mortimer had accused him of doing, but which Holmes had inflated into the scientific use of the imagination. So, Clausen very uh, uh, pointedly uh, illustrates here that Holmes had in fact arrived at the um, uh, criminal even before he went down to Dartmoor. Um, there had been a lot of guesswork and uh, in on, on Holmes's part, and he had been doing what Doctor Doctor Mortimer had been accusing him of doing. Therefore, um, the our argument here is that um, the imagination comes uh, way before the scientific examination. So imagination is something which paves the way for the scientific uh, process to come in uh, later. Therefore, uh, Clausen argues that uh, it, it is an effortless 
an unscientific way of arriving at the um, solution to the problem on the part of Holmes and the Hound of Basque Wales. Landscape plays an important role in Gothic fiction. Although the exotic late medieval and renaissance settings so beloved by authors such as Anne Radcliffe had given way to contemporary urban locations during the Victorian era, there was often still a place to be found for the lowering, eerie, sinister house in the middle of a desolate tract of a countryside as a means of evoking a sense of dread and unease, an isolated mansion in the midst of in the midst of fog shrouded moorland is difficult to beat. Greg Boswell points out that even though um, as the centuries progressed, um, the locations used by writers such as Anne Radcliffe have given way to more urban locations. Um, instead of medieval castles, uh, we had uh, townhouses um, as the locale in which the Gothic narratives were woven. Uh, despite this kind of um, tendency to update the nature of the architecture and the domestic structure, there was still a harking after, a demand for, a preference for a sinister house, a dangerous looking house, a rundown house in a desolate um, landscape in the countryside. Um, the fog particularly is uh, an added element that really intensifies the threat encoded uh, in terms of that particular house in a desolate setting. So the moors, as we have also seen in the case of Wuthering Heights, is particularly useful to communicate the desolateness of the mind of the society that can be found in that region. Therefore, uh, a similar setup is exploited by Doyle in The Hound of Baskervilles. During The Hound of Baskervilles, the move from sophisticated modern London to an elemental landscape of remote moorland is carefully described. Dr. Watson and Sir Henry Baskerville travel down to Devon by train and gazing through the window, Dr. Watson observes how the landscape becomes richer and more luxuriant on, their, on arrival at their station. Dr. Watson notes, rolling pasture lands curved upwards on either side of us, and old gabled houses peeped out from amid the thick green foliage. But behind the peaceful and sunlit countryside, there rose ever dark against the evening sky, the gloomy curve of the moor, broken by the jagged and sinister hills. It's a fantastic contrast that we get in this passage. If you uh, look at this passage closely, we have several settings in place. One is the sophisticated urban world of London and the train seems to be the uh, invention of science that seems to connect the various settings. We have London, the urban London, and then as they travel out of London and towards the countryside, they meet with rich pasture, green pastures. Um, it symbolizes luxuriance, fertility, and richness. Um, and when they arrive, they are struck by the uh, peaceful and verdant countryside. Um, the houses seem very peaceful. There are rich lands, fertile lands on either side. And yet there's one other setting, one other setting that is further removed uh, from the view, which is that of the moors. And you can see the word um, gloomy appearing at the end of that uh, statement, the gloomy curve. Uh, earlier it had been pasture lands luxuriant, richer, 
uh, um, spaces and now it's gloomy curve of the moor and look at the word jagged and sinister these are key words which at once suggest a gloominess um, of the mind of the psyche of the people inhabiting those regions so we have the gothic being gradually introduced into the setting, uh, the Gothic Moors, um, the gloomy curves, uh, entering this um, space which is uh, broken up uh, by different kinds of ideas and entities. Baskerville Hall itself looks like a ghost at the far end of a somber tunnel of overarching branches. The appearance of the house is unsettling, being an edifice that presents in its architecture an uneasy am amalgamation between the ancient and the modern. This jarring sense of the old and new being placed side by side is another typical characteristic of Gothic fiction. The very word ghost is used to describe Baskerville Hall and um, somber arches, somber is another word, melancholic, um, uh, something that is um, not very dark but gloomy, melancholic. The idea of greys, the color tone of grey comes into the picture and um, even the overarching um, branches are, are gloomy in uh, appearance and the house that we have uh, been discussing all along is, as we know, a, a combination, a hybrid uh, of the ancient and the modern. Uh, one can see the connections um, between um, the past and the present in terms of the way in which the house is being um, modernized or updated. This edifice from the past is being updated with the help of modernity, with the help of science, and the overall sense, um, the jarring sense, as uh, Buswell points out, uh, there is a sense of disjunction, there's a sense of rupture, there is friction in the combination that we find uh, in terms of the edifice of Baskerville Hall, and uh, the, the coexistence, the cheek by jowl, coexistence of um, Baskerville uh, Hall's um, attributes and characteristics uh, is uh, symbolic as well because um, that ties in neatly with the ideology of the Gothic narrative, the Gothic mode, which brings together in a conflicting manner uh, the ideas of the past and the present. Now let's look at the description of the hall. The whole front was draped in ivy, with a patch of clipped bare here and there where a window or a coat of arms broke through the dark veil. From the central block rose twin the, the twin towers, ancient crenellated, pierced with many loopholes. To right and left of the turrets were more modern wings of black granite. A dull light shone through heavily mullioned windows, and from the high chimneys which rose from the steep, high angled roof, there sprang a single black column of smoke. The hall is covered in ivy, particularly the front part of the hall, and it's an interesting um, setting for the hall, if something is covered, especially in the front, there is a sense that it is being smothered or suffocated and especially the entrance is uh, fully covered in ivy except for uh, patches here and there where the ivy is removed. Um, and even in the description, we get the sense that uh, the hall is being wailed. Look at the use of the word dark wail. And the word dark wail, the, the phrase wail, dark wail is used time and again in Gothic narratives in different contexts to suggest mystery, to suggest um, a kind of uh, incarceration, to suggest the limits to one's personal freedom. Therefore, one gets a sense that all is not well with this uh, hall too. 
and we have um, the towers it's in the hall and it immediately takes us back to the traditional Gothic halls um, which are castles um, in fact and look at the word uh, towers crenellated crenellated means battlements so there is a sense of a fortress like impression for the readers when they read this uh, description and yet there are modern elements there in the structure there are uh, wings of black granite so in addition to the towers the ancient towers and battlements we have the uh, modern wings made up of um, constructed with black granite and um, there is a partition heavily millioned uh, windows and then um, there is a single column of smoke so there is an element of desolation uh, when you see the single column of smoke gray smoke coming out of the house and it is uh, set in a very isolated um, uh, landscape as well so this hall is um, primarily giving off a sense of bleakness the gloomy mansion has an illustrious history in gothic fiction with thornfield hall from jane eyre published in 1847 wuthering heights from emily bronte's novel of the same name and bartram half from sheridan lefano's novel uncle silas uh, published in 1864 being among the most remarkable of the many examples so we have seen how the gloomy mansions are put to great use in gothic fiction in fact the hall becomes a narrative uh, element in the plot trajectory as we have seen in the case of um, Jane Eyre, um, even in the case of Wuthering Heights. During the novel, the past weighs heavily upon many of the characters. The curse of the Baskervilles, which haunts the family line, is first presented in a manuscript dating from 1742 and relates how the depraved activities of Sir Hugo Baskerville and his drunken attempts to rape a young woman resulting in his having his throat torn out by a gigantic hound. This sense of past family guilt being played out through subsequent generations is a common theme in Gothic fiction. A key way in which this is often represented is via the gloomy family portrait that, although showing the features of a distant ancestor, bears an uncanny resemblance to a present-day descendant. The Gothic curse is also an important trope of Gothic narratives. In other words, the curse appears as an element of the past which continues to haunt uh, the present characters and inhabitants of that uh, society. In the context of the Hound of Baskerville, there is also a curse and it dates back to 1742 to the 18th century and there is an ancestor of the Baskerville family called Sir Hugo who had attempted to assault a young woman and for this crime he was um, brutally murdered by a gigantic hound and this guilty past is turned into a curse uh, which seems to haunt all the generations of this uh, family. So, you can see how the past is continuing to haunt the present by um, by its presence in a, a narrative, um, in the narrative of the curse, which is handed down across generation, which seems to kind of uh, follow the footsteps of all the heirs to this family. So this is important in the gothic narratives we have seen gothic curses previously too especially in relation to the moonstone where we have seen how the diamond brings a curse with it 
to the family of Rachel Verinder, how the possessor is supposed to be cursed. So that gothic trope is um, present in a different form here in The Hound of Baskerville's 2. So this is a common theme in gothic fiction and the point is that the curse is a figment of the past which is haunting all the um, present and the future generations. Now, how is this um, materialized? Uh, it is materialized, um, shown in narratives through the gloomy family portrait. The picture of the ancestor is usually present in the hall, house, castle, and one can see the past being literalized through this kind of structure, such as the portrait. And, um, and there is a resemblance between this past ancestor and, and the present descendant. So thus we see a strong bond being uh, connected between the uh, people of the past and the present. Thank you for watching. I'll continue in the next session.